And all of God's people said, Amen. I was just standing there thinking about how good God has been to me. I don't know about you, but I can testify that he has been good to me. It doesn't matter who won yesterday. It doesn't matter who lost yesterday. I won today because I got up. Somebody ought to say amen. Colossians chapter 1. I want to invite you back to where we left off on last week. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. I'll start with verse 19 for continuity of thought. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Through death, through death, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel yes, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I Paul have become a servant you may be seated I want to talk about the cross makes peace. The cross makes peace. Uh, the cross makes peace. I, I shared with you last week, and again, I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, you're going to have to check who your commander in chief is. Because when you know who your commander in chief is, you understand he's over creation. You understand he's over the church. And then finally you recognize he's over the cross. And I need you to just say that with me, over the cross. So if you know who your commander in chief is, he's over the cross. You may not like the cross, but he's over the cross. Too many believers see the cross as an historical event that will take them to heaven rather than a current event containing everything you need to bring heaven on earth. In other words, the cross is not just some historical event. But God uses the cross to get heaven to visit us while we're on earth. Okay, let me say it another way. We, we, we used to say in the country, the preacher used to talk about going to heaven and talks about how good heaven was. But I need some heaven on earth. Because I, I don't know when I'm going 
to heaven up there. I, I need some heaven on earth. I need something to happen in my life to help me get through some of the stuff that I go through on a daily basis. Can, can you say amen right there? And when you look at verse 19, he says, because the fullness is in him. The power to govern and the right to preside over you. So when you look at verse 19, it says in essence that God has the right to govern your life, to preside over your life, to provide, to preside over the church, to preside over you because you are the church. So the power that God put in his son, he has put in us. So that whatever we go through, we have the power to go through it because God has the right to test us to see if we have the power to go through it. Let, let me see if I can't say it another way. Everything you're going through, you have the power to get through it. But you're going to have to make up in your mind whether or not you want to go through it. That's why I love what David says in Psalm 23. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley. He recognizes the fact that he didn't go to the valley to stay. He understood he was going through the valley. And sometime in life, it looks like you're going to die. It looks like you're going to perish. There's some dark days, but guess what? You're going through the darkness. And on the other side, And I love it when he says the shadow of death, the, the shadow of death. He, he doesn't say death. He says the shadow of death. Why, why the shadow, Pastor? Because here, here's what I discovered. You cannot have a shadow without light. So whenever you think life is dark, just learn to look for the light because it's the light that's going to cast the shadow to let you know it looks like you're dead. But baby, if you just keep getting up, if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, you're going to see light at the end of the tunnel. 1983, I was in the hospital in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and... They had called my parents and said, we lost your son. But when my dad got to the hospital, I was in the bed on tubes, but I was still alive. And when I came out and I went back to school, everybody was saying, did you see a light at the end of a tunnel? I didn't see a light. I didn't see a tunnel, but I saw machines and I saw tubes and I recognized I was still here. I had come through the valley of the shadow of death but that next time I awakened I noticed I was in a different place. I, I came to tell you, listen brothers and sisters, you may have to bear crosses. You may not like the crosses that you bear but I came to tell you if you learn how to bear it with the Lord you can come through with power, unspeakable power. I looked at this text, and it's good to know the text because notice in the past. Can you say the past? That, that's the first thing, in the past. He said, notice this. Once you were alienated. <laughs> I wish I had more time. Once you were alienated. Can I talk to the folk who used to be alienated from God, separated from God? Can, can I talk to the folk who used to couldn't come in here? Can I, can I talk to the folk who used to wouldn't come to church? Can I talk to the folk who were alienated from God? Can I talk to the folk that based on what you did yesterday, you ought not be in here today. But because he's good, so good, that after all you did yesterday and last night, you still walked in here. And you still recognize you don't deserve to be in here. But because you're no longer alienated, you're no longer separated. Brothers and sisters, write this down. Listen, I need to say this. Somebody needs to hear this. Your identity in Christ is not based on performance. 
Let me slow down. <laughs> Your identity in Christ is not based on performance. Brothers and sisters, it's based on your relationship. So if I don't perform like I should, I still have a relationship with him. Okay, let me say it this way. If the Jaguars didn't perform like they should have, I want to know you still have a relationship with them. If the Grambling Tigers didn't perform like you wanted them to, do you still have a relationship with them? If the saints don't perform how you want them to today, I need to know do you still have a relationship? Because here's what I discovered, brothers and sisters. If I never do everything right, I still have a relationship with God. If I'm not perfect, I still have a relationship with God. If I slip, stumble, or fall, I still have a relationship with God. If I mess around and cuss somebody out, I still have a relationship with God. I thought I'd get three or four hundred of you right there. If you were sipping on gin and juice yesterday, I still think you have a relationship with him. And if you were sipping on gin and juice yesterday, guess what? On first Sunday, we're going to be sipping on grape juice. Come on back. First Sunday. We see if we can't correct it. Because all you have to do is get around the wrong crowd, get around the wrong people, and they'll alienate you from the relationship that you have with God. But the good news is, guess what? They can't alienate you permanently. They can only do it temporarily. I looked at the text. The text says, your identity. But then watch this. And I heard somebody say this earlier in the choir. Grace enables you to do what God expects you to do. Grace enables you to do what God expects you to do. So now when I can't do what I ought to do, then grace steps in and helps me do what God expects me to do. See, there's some stuff God expects me to do on Sunday that I also ought to do on Monday. But just because I don't do it on Monday doesn't mean he didn't love me on Sunday. God expects grace to step in when I want to do wrong and say, wait a minute. You know how good I've been to you? Okay, let, let, me, let, let, me, let me slow down. Let me slow down. Let, let me slow down. Every time I get on an airplane and I go somewhere and I come back home, Every time I get on an airplane, go somewhere, and come back home, you know what I think about? God is good to me. Okay, I used to be slow too. I'm from Newton, Louisiana. My first plane ride was a crop duster. They used to go outside and turn the propeller to start it. Now I'm riding on jets. I, I think they just said, you been so good to me? Every time I go somewhere, I think about how good God, that's his grace. I didn't deserve any of it. That's his grace. And I used to be alienated from God, separated from God. And one of the greatest challenges, I want you to think about this. We argue and fight about aliens, illegal immigrants. Now I want you to think about this. Put your thinking head on. The very country that went to Africa and got people who were free, I'm talking about grace, and enslaved them, brought them over here and made citizens out of them, are the same people, the same country that has barbed wire and booby traps to stop people from leaving a country to come to this country for freedom. And you mean to tell me when this is the home of the brave and the land of the free. 
You only want people here who have a green card. Well, who is going to put your roof on the house? Who gonna hang your sheetrock? Not Pookie. Not Ray Ray. I mean, they're not going to hit a lick at a snake. So, so, so you, you better get some green cards for somebody because I know the people who were brought over here in 1619 try to get them to do that kind of work if you want them. We got a folding chair waiting on you. When I think about my past, and I think about the stuff I used to do, they wouldn't have let me come in church. I said like this, if you knew some of the stuff I did at Southern, some of it, you try to vote me out now. But I'm so glad I looked at the text. <laughs> He says, enemies in your own mind. I need you to highlight this. Enemies in your own mind. Let me tell you something. Whenever you start thinking that you are an enemy to God in your mind, that's the devil in your head. Because guess what? You are not an enemy to God. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did last week. If you are God's child, you still his child. You are not an enemy to God. But if the enemy can get that thought in your mind, Listen to me, in your mind, it's, it's in your understanding, it's, it's in your thought. If, if, you can just, if you can just get it in the thought, let me tell you how powerful a thought is. Let me tell you how powerful a thought is. Do you believe? I'm keeping receipts. I want you to think about this. How can Deion Sanders do what he did at Jackson State in a year? Uh, in a year. And turn around and go to Colorado and do even more in a year with more resources. Come, come in, come in. If, if you can just get people to think better about themselves, if you can just get people to think that they are better than what other people tell them that they are, they, they might mess around and win two games in a row. Okay, can I say it another way? If you stopped at what people said about you, would you be where you are? See, learn how not to let what people tell you you are become who you are. I, I had to learn this a long time ago. Just because they say it doesn't mean that's you. And, and I looked at this passage and he said, in your mind. See, the devil works on your mind. And, and I like the terms he uses in the text. He used reconcile. He uses the word reconcile. I, I like that word reconcile. It's, it's logizomai. And logizomai is where we get our term logarithms from. It's, it's, it's an accounting term. It's, it's accounting term. It's, it's when you look at a ledger and you have pluses and minuses, debits and credits. He says, in other words, when I look at it in my mind, it doesn't make sense. When I look at it in my mind, it doesn't add up. But when I look at it through the spiritual mind of God, it, it makes more sense. It doesn't look right when I think about it. But when I think about it from the terms of how God is working, it, it adds some stuff. Where there were some negatives. Let me see if I can't say it another way. Have you ever noticed... That when you can start getting positive thoughts in your mind, 
it erases the negative thoughts that are in your mind. And as long as you keep thinking that as a child of God, that you've got to perform a certain way, you've got to be perfect, guess what? You'll never be what God wants you to be. You will always see yourself as an enemy. But I remember what my ancestors said. I looked at my hands. My hands looked new. I looked at my feet. And they did too. They, they simply said it didn't make sense. I couldn't reconcile it in my mind. But let me tell you what happened. They were simply saying because I got a new way of thinking. My old hands look like new hands. My old feet look like new feet. Why? Because I no longer think about it the way I used to think about it. Brothers and sisters, alienation makes you a habitual enemy. Whenever the enemy gets you out there. You become a habitual enemy. He gets you to make the same mistake over and over and over again. Listen to me. If he can get you out of church, if he can get you to feeling bad about your presence in church, if he can get you to feel bad about what you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing, and that's why you don't come to church, guess what? He'll get you to stay out of church. And the longer you stay out, the more you become a habitual enemy. So instead of cussing every other sentence, it's every other word. Amen. Instead of lying every other paragraph, it's every word that come out your mouth. If he can get you to start thinking about the stuff that you do wrong, if he can keep bringing up your past, then he says evil behavior. Your wicked works make you an enemy. The stuff you're doing makes you an enemy. Listen to me. What the enemy loves to do is bring up your past. It's always amazing to me when folk want to tell me, I remember when. And I tell them, I remember when too. You don't have to remind me. I know what I did. And I know who I did it with. So you don't have to bring it up to me because guess what? You're not going to bother me. Matter of fact, I see Brother Bones back there. Listen, Brother Bones can tell you stuff I did. But I beat you to the punch. I tell you what I did. And guess what? And I tell you, I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because he forgave me of that stuff. That that was in my past is in my past. So don't bring it up. Ain't no need of talking about it. Talk to the hand. I already know what I've done. And my Bible says he cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. Let me see if I can't make that plain. Get in your car and start going east on I-10 and just keep driving east. And I promise you, you'll never run into the west. In other words, when you look at your sins, God forgets about it because he never lets it run into it again. Okay, let me say it another way. When God forgives you of your sin, you can't bump back into your sin again because he's forgotten about it. But I like this term. It's in this text. Watch this. It's the term engrafted. It's the picture. It's the idea of being grafted. I need you to get this. It's grafted. You see, you are grafted into Christ. Look, look at the text. I want you to see it. I want you to see this. He says you have been reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. You've been grafted into the body. You, you've been grafted into the body. You've been grafted into the body. You've been grafted. Let me get this picture. I want you to get this. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 says that you are the seed of David. But then, brothers and sisters, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 says that you are the root of Jesse. You are a tree. You are the cross. Whenever you talk about the cross, whenever you think about the cross, the cross is I crossed out. I crossed out. Once you become saved, it's no longer about I. It's about him. And once you've been engrafted into him, it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Because now you have a new lease on life. Let me see if I can't put it in agricultural terms. Have you ever seen a big pecan? A big pecan. 
Big gone. Big ones. Okay, now, the big ones, that's not natural. Are y'all in the house? And, and when you go out in the wild, when you have a wild pecan tree, they are small pecans. Say, say small. Okay, because I know you city slicker. Say small. It's small. Okay. So if you, if you get a tree, a pecan tree in the wild, it's small. But in order to get a big pecan on a small pecan tree, you have to graft the small pecan tree with that from a big pecan tree. All right, watch this. So what you do, you catch the bud of the small pecan tree. And you cut out the bud of the small pecan tree just down beneath the first layer, just down beneath the epidural layer. You cut it top and bottom. And you take out that bud from the small pecan tree. And then you take a bud from the big pecan tree and cut it out of the big pecan tree. Take the bud from the big pecan tree and put it in the small pecan tree and then tape it up and wrap it up so that it does not lose moisture. And the cells will automatically go to the site where the injury has taken place. And then before you know it, brothers and sisters, that old bud the bird from the small pecan tree gets stuck to the bird of the new pecan tree or the big pecan tree. And so what winds up happening now when this little pecan tree starts having pecans, they're going to be big pecans. Why, Pastor? Because they took the bird from the small tree out and put the bird from the big tree in. Let me see if I can't say it like this. Listen. I was a small pecan, but Jesus Christ, the growing bird, is the big pecan. And when I became saved, he grafted me into that big pecan. And so now every time you see my pecans, I have big pecans because I've been grafted into the little pecan tree. And I'm no longer a little pecan because I'm part of the big pecan. This is what happened on Calvary. When you and I were in our sins, Jesus was the little tree. And he took the little tree and hooked it to the big tree, which was the cross. That's why he's the root of Jesse and the seed of David. And when he died on Calvary, because his blood was shed for us, that's what caused the blood to tie the two together. And now that we're tied together, guess what? Every time you see me, I have the peace of the cross. That's the P-E-A-C-E. -E because of the P-I-E. Oh, I missed you. Because of the P-I-E-C-E, -E, I now have the P-E-A-C-E. -E. I understand that the cross brings me peace. And it brings me peace of mind. But then I saw this. Watch this. Then it says, present, reconciled, the physical body. Brothers and sisters, when you look at Luke 9, 23, he says this, take up your cross daily. I like this, Brother Arthur, take up your cross daily. That means every day you get up, you have to pick up your cross. Every day you get up, you have to pick up your cross. Every day you wake up, you have to pick up your cross. Now, you don't know if it's going to be a good day or a bad day. But here's what I've discovered. Any day that you get up is a good day. Am I talking to anybody? And here's what I've discovered. When he says that you have to pick up your cross, he says, in essence, you've got to embrace the struggles and endure the suffering that accompanies your walk with Christ. Every day you wake up, you're going to have to embrace the struggle of what it means to be African-American. You're going to have to embrace that. You're going to have to embrace the struggle of what it means not to have everything you need. You're going to have to embrace the struggle of what it means to live in a society that judges you just by your outward appearance. You're going to have to learn to deal with that. 
Because here's what I've discovered, brothers and sisters. You can't have a successful present if you keep looking at your past. If you keep letting what happened in the past affect your present, you won't have a future. Listen to me carefully, brothers and sisters. The songwriter said it this way. The cross is the emblem of suffering and shame. And he says, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. He says, in essence, every day as a sinner saved by grace, I have to slay the devil. Every day I get up, I have to slay the devil. Slay means to kill. Now, let me help you write this real quick. Because, see, it's popular in church now for people to be slain in the spirit. Now, I don't have a problem with you being slain in the spirit. But you shouldn't have to be slain every day. I think I said something. L listen. If you kill that spirit Monday, I shouldn't have to kill that same spirit Tuesday. I mean, if, if I kill that spirit of lying on Monday, I shouldn't have to kill it again on Tuesday. If I kill that spirit of cussing on Monday, I shouldn't have to kill it on Tuesday. Because see, once you slay it, it's dead. Come here. Come here. This is what's wrong with us. If you say you saved and the power of God is in you, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So once you kill that demon, that demon shouldn't rise up again. So if you got to slay it over and over, evidently you didn't kill it. You just been playing with it. Because if you really want to kill the demon, you kill it and it does not come back. I think I said something right there. But I've discovered what it is. The songwriter tells us, must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. And he hurry up and answer and said, no. There's a cross for me. See, whatever you are bearing, whatever cross you are bearing, make sure it's not a crop that you're reaping. Because some of these crosses that we are bearing are really not crosses. They're really crops. And in case you don't know what that means, as a man sow it, that shall he also reap. So some of this bad stuff that's happening to you, it's not a cross, it's a crop. And you got to stop doing that. Don't make me call out some names. Some of the stuff we do, we need to stop doing that. Some of the stuff we do, we need to stop doing it. Why, Pastor? Because if I understand that's how the enemy operates in my life, I need to kill that. Let me go on. Let me do this. Watch this. The songwriter said, the consecrated cross I bear. The consecrated cross I bear. See, when you bear a cross, it should be a consecrated cross. A cross that you know you're carrying because of Christ. And he says through death, it presents you holy in his sight 
without blemish and free from accusation. Listen to me good. When you are carrying the cross of Christ, the cross of Calvary, when you're carrying it, I don't care what happens to you, God's going to make sure there are no blemishes. He's going to make sure that when you get through carrying this cross, it will be free from accusation. Let me say it to you like this. Here's what I discovered. When you're carrying a cross for Calvary, people may talk about you, but when they get through talking about you and looking at you, they're going to see that you are not the you that they were talking about. I, I got to close. I, I think I missed you. I lost you. He says, you've got to be persistent. He says, if you continue, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, all the enemy wants you to do is lose hope. When you lose hope, you'll fall back into your past habits. I've got to leave you here. I don't have peace in my life, Pastor. Maybe it's because you don't see the cross that you're bearing as God's tool to make you better. Maybe you don't see the stuff you're going through as making you better. Maybe you see it as something bad. And if you see it as something bad, you haven't read your Bible. Because Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Can I close with this? I love that passage. It's conclusive, it's inclusive, and it's exclusive. It's conclusive because it says, and we know. It's inclusive because it says, all things. And it's exclusive because it's only for those who love the Lord. So I came to tell you, when you see me walking around beneath a heavy load and I'm still smiling, I'm still waving my hand, I'm still praising God, is because I understand that the cross that I'm carrying is a consecrated cross. It's a cross that's designed to make me better. It's a cross that's designed to make me stronger. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what crosses you may be bearing. But I came to tell you if you learn to thank God for your crosses. If you learn to tell God I appreciate my ups and I appreciate my downs. Then you'll find out what it's like to have peace that passes all understanding. When everybody else is losing their mind, I have peace. When everybody else is acting a fool, I have peace. Why? Because I've already, I've already heard the good news. I've already heard the gospel. And in case you haven't heard the gospel, in case you haven't heard the good news, can I tell you what the good news is? Can I tell you what the gospel is? He died on Friday. Stay dead on Friday night. Stay dead all Saturday, but early Sunday morning, he got up out the grave with all power in his hand. Why are you saying that, Pastor? Because it may look like you're going to die. It may look like you're going to perish. But can I tell you, Sunday morning's coming. And when Sunday morning comes, you will walk out with a new hope. You will walk out with new power. You'll walk out saying, if it had not been for the Lord 
in my life, where would I be? Brothers and sisters, if it were not for the cross, we wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't be what we are. Stop cursing your crosses and start telling God, thank you for the cross. Because remember, the cross is I crossed out. And when I stop thinking about it as my cross and start thinking about it as his cross, when I can't handle it, it's just right for him to handle it. Don't you lose your peace because you're having a bare cross. Just because you're going through it, people ought not see you struggling. You ought to at least act like you ought to at least act like you're not going through what you're going through. Did you hear what I said? You ought to at least act like because the word on the street is you're going through but you ought not act like it. You ought not look like it. Talk to me if you can. Don't you know how to smile? Don't you know how to smile when it doesn't look good? Don't you know how to wave your hand when it don't look good? Don't you know how to push yourself when you don't want to go? Don't you let your cross stop you from being everything that God wants you to be. Let's stand all over this house. I want